morning, First Temple. My name's Evan. I'm the teaching pastor here. If I don't know you, I would love to get to know you. Um, we have a connection point right over there, and that's a great place to go. If you have questions about our church or need prayer or anything like that, or if you just want to like introduce yourself and help get connected to the church, I'll be there afterwards, and I'd love to meet you. I brought my bullhorn. Now, just I have a feeling, I have a feeling that you guys love to see pastors with bullhorns, right? Like everybody loves to see a pastor with a bullhorn. You're like, I don't know if I don't know what if I'm supposed to say yes or no to this. I hate that. Yeah. Uh, when my wife and I, we had not been married very long, and some of our favorite musical bands that were playing together at a music festival, we went to go see them. We were so excited, and we were walking in to the venue, and there was this guy. He was standing on some, like, blocks there right in the entrance so that he was above everybody else, and he had this bullhorn. And he was just yelling. I mean, he was yelling at everybody, and he looked right at my wife and I and was like, you need to turn to Jesus. Stop doing what you're doing. You need to know Jesus. You're going to hell. I was a little angry. I'll be honest. I was a little angry. First of all, I was like, sir, I have receipts. Like, I'm in the middle of seminary. Like, I have literal receipts of money that I am paying to know more and more about God. Like, you don't know me, sir. I wanted to get up there and maybe do some unkind things. As my anger cooled a little bit, I just kind of got sad. Because I was watching all these people come in and this guy just screaming at them. It's like, man, I want people to know Jesus too. I really want people to know Jesus, but... This is not working. <laughs> this is not working. We're continuing this series, The God That Jesus Prayed To. We're looking at prayers of Jesus, that Jesus, God in flesh, praying to the Father. Because you can learn a lot about what somebody thinks about God by how they pray. So we're going to learn from Jesus some of these characteristics of God that, that he makes clear to us in his prayers as we overhear them. We'll see a prayer in John 17 and in Matthew 6, we'll look at those throughout this series, and they'll illuminate some, some attributes of God for us. And today, the attribute of God that gets illuminated is the one true God, that God is the one true God. And I brought the bullhorn, because especially that attribute, but, but lots of times when we read Scripture and engage with Scripture, I think the temptation is to take whatever we're receiving and apply it to everyone but ourselves, right? And so a good rule when reading the scripture is to apply it to yourself before other people. So often we see something like God is the one true God, and we're like, yeah, all right, perfect. Let's tell everybody. These people need to know, and we start yelling. So the ground rules for this morning, I want you to just commit with me to see what this means to you, not try to use it against anybody. Okay, is that fair? We understand? That's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to try to see how the scripture is speaking to us and our relationship with God before uh, we try to use it or weaponize it against somebody else. Well, it's not, we're not going to participate in that this morning. But that's the temptation, especially for one like this. And, and any time that scripture might push us or challenge us a little bit, is it's really easy to hide behind a bullhorn. And point out everybody else's issues and never examine our own. That's not what we're about. So we're going to turn to John chapter 17. We're going to dive in right there. This is Jesus praying. He's just been teaching his disciples. And this is the night that he's about to be betrayed and he's going to go to the cross. He's going to give up his life, be killed. Three days later, he'll raise from the grave. And so he's just given his last teaching and now this prayer is the prayer that he prays to the Father right before he goes to the cross. We get to listen in, overhear what Jesus is praying to the Father. So we're going to be focusing on verse 3, but I want to read 17, 1 through 3 as we get started. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. The moment we've been waiting for, the, the thing that we've been building up to is come. It's happening. And what will happen in this hour, God, may you glorify your son that is raise up, magnify, put attention on your son that the son may then glorify, point to, magnify you. 
And even as you gave him authority over all flesh, all humanity, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. God, so glorify, Jesus says, glorify me so I can glorify you. You've given me authority over all people so that I can give them eternal life. And then verse 3, this is eternal life, that we may know you, the only, the one true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. The one true God. Today, I want us to be asking as we engage with this text. How can I see that I am worshiping, knowing, getting to know, growing in the one true God? The first way I think that we can know that we're worshiping the one true God as we see in this text is that the one true God tells us and shows us who he is. He will always tell us and show us who he is. In creative writing, there's this idea. They call it the, the golden rule of writing. And that is show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. When, when you're trying to get a character or a situation, you're trying to communicate that to people, you could tell them about it, but it is better if you show them what you mean. For example, you could write, James is scared of the dark. And I'll say, okay, we got James is scared of the dark. Or you could write, when his mother turned off the light, James clutched his blanket and he felt the muscles in his back tense. You see the difference? We, we, we know that James is scared of the dark by the sentence, second sentence, but, but it's been illuminated for us. We, we can kind of imagine what it's like. We can put ourselves in the situation. Maybe you thought of a time when you were scared. Maybe you imagined the room as the lights went out. See, Jesus is going to say to us, yes, you are the one true God. But everything that Jesus has done and taught and been, everything that we see in the story of God and humanity in the scripture is not just to tell us about God. It's to show us what God is like. So Jesus is saying, they are going to see, glorify your son and glorify, may, my, may I glorify you. How? Because the hour has come and what I'm about to do is going to show them that you are the one true God. What I'm about to do when I go to the cross and I give up my life and I defeat death once and for all and show them that they, if they follow me, can defeat death too, we're going to show them. We're going to show them that you are good and who you are by what we do. It's the difference between just telling people that God is good and God loves you. And God becoming flesh and dwelling among us in the person of Jesus. Of God so loving the world that he gave his only son. So that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We know that God is the one true God, not because he just tells us, because he shows us. There's a saying right now that's really popular, if somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Right? You all know people who say all the right things, but they don't show you the right things. Jesus is showing us what God is like. And you may have questions about who is this God and what is God like and and is, does it matter? And does he care? I mean, all this, these questions, and they are fair, deep, important questions. Jesus shows us what God is like. He tells us what God is like in his teaching. He shows us in his life and his sacrifice. We know the one true God because he shows us and he tells us. Now, I'll admit, though, when I read this passage and my bullhorn tendencies start to, 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 to like, Get, get, get ready to go, and I want to I point this text at other people. I, I read this idea of Jesus as the one, one true God, and I think, okay, well, that, that's important for everybody else to know, right? Because cause I know about God, like, I'm here uh, on a Christian church on a Sunday morning. Like, this is maybe for somebody who worships uh, somebody, some other God, like, like maybe John is thinking about, about Roman gods, or maybe people who, who worship, like, the God of Islam or Hindu gods. Maybe this is passages for them. They need to know about the one true God. I want us to remember that, that we need to think what this means for us. When Jesus talks about his authority over all flesh, he's talking about all people. That's me and you too. 
And we have to remember that the people that are about to turn on him and take him and kill him are people who believed in God. And yet their idea of God was not something that fit with Jesus. And so even though Jesus was right in front of them, they didn't know, they didn't recognize the one true God. So we know he's the one true God because of what he shows us and tells us. And also we'll know that he's the one true God because when we follow the one true God, it will challenge us. It will challenge where we're content. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I love that. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus reveals to us what God is like, the image of the invisible God. But I would argue that oftentimes our image of Jesus reveals what kind of invisible gods we have in ourselves. That we might, might kind of shift Jesus, twist Jesus to look like the God that we'd prefer to worship. A God that might make us a little more comfortable, that might be a little bit more easy, that might not push us so much, that might not ever challenge us, that might be okay with the things that, that God's really not okay with. Y'all know there's always a kid there's always one kid. Some of you are probably in this room were that kid or are that kid that, that they go to the soda, the soda machine at a restaurant, you know, this kid, and, and they get a little bit of Coke, and then they get a little bit of Dr. Pepper, and then they get a little bit of Sprite, and then they get a little bit of orange soda, and then they get a little bit of root beer, and then because they like to watch the world burn, they get a little bit of blue Powerade on top. Oh. Y'all know this kid. We see that and we're like, oh, okay. Or some of you are like, no, it's delicious. You should try it. (laughs) You keep doing you. That's great. Um, I think we do that with with Jesus. I think we do that with our faith. I think we go, yeah, I'm going to start with a little bit of Jesus. But I'm going to also put in a little bit of uh, the politicians I like the most right here. And I'm going to put in a little bit of like my desire for like what I want financially. And my financial success, I'm going to put that right there. And let's see, like, what else could I add to that? I'm going to listen to also, like, all the voices around me and what they're saying about me. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. I'm going to listen to my social media feed. I'm going to put a lot of that in there. Some of us have put a lot of that in there. I'm going to listen to, like, like, how I feel about myself when I check my Instagram <laughs> notifications. Well, I'm going to worship that a little bit. And all of a sudden, yeah, we, we worship... Jesus, we, we call him Jesus. But it no longer looks a lot like the Jesus that has been shown to us. The God that, that, that the scriptures tell us about, it no longer challenges us. We add things to make it so that we're nice and comfortable. Uh, a couple years ago, I was listening to this incredible sermon uh, Beth Moore was preaching, and I was there, and it was like very starstruck. She was talking about the, the book of Luke, and she'd been reading the book of Luke and noticed again and again in the book of Luke there was this phrase, this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus. And she pointed out that, that for her, as she was wrestling with, with the text, she realized that in the world there's, there's a difference between this Jesus And that Jesus. Between this Jesus that that is shown, that the scripture tells us about, that challenges us, and that Jesus that's got a little bit of some other things in it. She said this, this Jesus calls people to follow him and become fishers of people. We tell that Jesus, you follow me and I will make you fishy to people. This is just a great line. She says, this Jesus calls calls us to take up our cross and follow me. That Jesus tells us to get in our car and go to church. I know you're all like, you're out of church. You want us to come to church. I know we we should be at church. But is that it? To just show up, feel good, go home? Is that all Jesus is calling us to? I don't see that with this Jesus. And that, that message struck with me that day and continues to stick with me, the one true God will challenge us and push us and calls us to be transformed and become more and more like him. And 
we don't like that, that Jesus. We distract ourselves from the real Jesus and what he calls us to be. We, we distract ourselves and don't listen and don't spend time in prayer and in scripture, not just because maybe we don't want to do it, but maybe because it calls us to look at ourselves. It's easier to hold up the bullhorn. The one true God will challenge our contentment, and, and the one true God also will calm our restlessness. The one true God also brings us peace. Now, I talked about the, the challenges that this Jesus calls us to. I mean, take up your cross and follow me is a challenge, but there is peace, and there is peace when you follow Jesus where Jesus is calling you to go. When you embrace the Jesus we find in Scripture and His love and His hope and His message and His purpose, and you get to participate with the God who is making the world right and will make the world right and invites us to be part of it now. I want to read 17, uh, 3 again. John 17, 3 again says this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, this is eternal life, knowing the one true God. I used to of Christianity, especially when I was a kid, was like, you you show up, you go to church, and then when you die, you get swooped away, and you get to go to like some fluffy cloud heaven, and you get to go there, and that's better than the alternative, so take your get-out-of-jail-free card and be happy, right? That's kind of what I thought the point of Christianity was, just float away someday. And we discover in Jesus that, yes, eternity is given to us, life forever. That when Jesus defeats death, he is the first fruits that his followers will defeat death too. That there will be a future with no more crying or pain or tears. That the world will be made right. But look at what Jesus says. This is eternal life that you may know the one true God. Not that you will float away, but that you will know the one true God. And this is not just something that happens someday in the future. It is something that begins the moment we begin to know the one true God. This brings calm to our restlessness because suddenly our life has purpose and meaning and direction and promise that we get to be a part of what God is doing in the world when the world around us is scary and difficult. We are invited to new life, abundant life, life now. See, we, we, we've often thought that Christianity is about us breaking into eternity, right, and sneaking in somehow, when really it's all about eternity breaking into us. And together, as the people of God, living with purpose and promise and hope. Being the kind of people that show and tell who God is, not just with our words, but with our lives in this city right now. In Matthew 6, verse 10, uh, in the prayer that Jesus is teaching, he, he says, Pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, the God of the universe. Inviting us to his eternity now. Jesus has shown us what God is like, tells us what God is like, challenges us. The one true God challenges us and pushes us by the power of the Spirit to be transformed, to be more like him. He brings us peace and comfort. And those of us who know the one true God, we are then invited to show the one true God to the world. So how do we do that? How do we be people who show the one true God to the world? I think it looks a lot like uh, Jesus. (laughs) You notice Jesus talking about the one true God. He doesn't talk about it with a bullhorn. He reveals this to us in prayer. It's a commitment to prayer and to Scripture, to knowing this God that we are invited to know. He says, you will know God, the one true God, that word know is not like knowledge and information. It's, it's a word that's much deeper. It's a word you would just use for like a spouse or a best friend, and it's reciprocal, that you would know them, and they would know you, and you would know each other so deeply. He's saying God knows you, and you get to know God starting now. 
what would it look like to live like you do? To let this God of the universe transform you. I want a church that looks like that. In the Psalms, there's this famous Psalm, Psalm 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. You could translate that, cease from striving and know that I am God. I don't know about you, but ceasing from striving sounds really good. We strive and we strive and we strive to serve all kinds of gods, Christian-ish gods. And Jesus says, be still, know the one true God, I am with you. We are called to know, to show this God. So how will we show it? Will we be a bullhorn or a blessing? This great teacher uh, talked about these three questions that are really helpful for us as we evaluate our own spiritual lives. They really help us see how our spiritual growth is going. So I'm going to ask you these three questions. The first question to ask yourself is, is do you love God? Okay, that's question one. Do you love God? Question two is, do you love your neighbor? Pretty good question. Do you love your neighbor? Question three is, do you mind if I ask them? Do you love God? Do you love your neighbor? Do you mind if I ask them? With the bullhorn up, defense is up pointing at everybody else and trying to figure out why they're wrong. <laughs> it doesn't look like loving God and loving neighbor, but being close. Being transformed to be more and more like Jesus who would lay down his life for us. If we could live like that. And then when we ask, do you love God, do you love your neighbor? I think they would say, yes, we've seen it. I want to encourage you this week, um, we're doing a reading plan together. We're going to read Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and Acts the remainder of this year as well as all the Psalms. Uh, our reading plan is available. It's on our website. It's on our social media too. Um, we've got some printouts of it and everything. Uh, we'll be in Matthew 5 through 7 this week. I'd love for you to read that as well. Just be in the scripture. You can't know God unless you're like spending time with God. If you want some more resources about growing your own faith, these are two books that are really helpful. Uh, the Deeply Formed Life by Rich Viotis, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. I recommend both of those. They've helped shape me a lot this year. The last thing I mentioned briefly at the beginning and we're doing as a, a challenge as a church together uh, for this series is, is the spiritual practice of sleep. You're like, I don't know what attributes of God have to do with sleep. Here's the deal. Like, I think sleep is difficult for us been difficult for me some because there's always so much going on and so much we think we have to do and so much we're scared to confront and, and there's so much we can distract ourselves with and like spend time scrolling through and just keep doom scrolling and doom scrolling has that ever helped anyone it doesn't help me but I try it like it will there's something about like sleep and caring for yourself and your soul so you can care for others and being able to like unplug enough and say Okay, I, I really, if I know God, I'm going to cease from striving so I can like turn off the things and put down the screens and like rest and actually sleep. And I realize you're going to have to be quiet and that may cause you to like look inside yourself. <laughs> and that's scary, I know. But I really believe that we are called to be people who can rest in the goodness of God and be healthy because we do. So we want to challenge you to 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 pick up that practice of sleep. I'm preaching to myself here. Um, there are, are, are tactics I know that work for me, but hard for me to commit to, like plugging my phone in another room a couple hours before bed so that I won't look at it. That helps a lot. It's hard to do, I know, for some of us who can be like addicted to it, but, but I would really recommend it to try it. Sometimes on smartphones, they have like things you can put in that turn off apps or change the colors or put it to sleep as you get close to bedtime. I would encourage you to do that. But if we can tell a lot about somebody and what they think about God by how they pray, another resource I want for you is this, this prayer, this night prayer. I use it a lot with students, and it's been really helpful for me when things are scary or difficult. I have a hard time slowing down my mind and resting. Um, so 
I want to pray this over you as we close. And I just want you to imagine like what it's like to be in a stressful time, a stressful night, and hear what it looks like to trust in, to commune with the one true God. Will you pray with me? Lord, you have been with me all through the day. Stay with me now. As shadows lengthen into darkness, let the noisy world grow quiet. Let its feverish concerns be stilled, its voices silenced. In the final moments of this day, remind me of what is real. And let me not forget that you were as present in the stresses of the day just past as you are now in the silence of this night. You have made me for day and for night, for work and for rest, for both heaven and earth. Here in this night, let me embrace and not regret the mysterious beauty of my humanity. Keep me in your embrace through the night and all the day to come. Surround me with your silence. And give me the rest that only you can give. Real peace. Now, forever. Amen.